There we go. Got it. Yep. Yep. It knows that I'm the leader now. Okay. <laughs> That's a good thing. Hi, Paul. How are you? Good. How are you, sir? Good. Thanks. Let's uh, get motor in here. I better share screen first. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, and how are you? Amazing. How about you? Uh, good. I'm not maybe amazing, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> no, no, no major, no major frustrations or complaints in my day. So, yes, sir. Uh, um, let's see here. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Yes. Good. Great. Okay. All right, so starting with chapter five, we're going to start to look at, in, in a business environment, how do we create the various forms of very common types of business communication that, you know, you all have to write during your careers. And uh, not only just um, the, the types of documents, but the standards for how people use them, how we put them together, how they're structured. Uh, tonight, we're talking specifically about email and also inner office memos. So inner office memos have pretty much been replaced by email. A memo was something that used to be, you know, printed out on paper and passed around in the days before we had email. But even today in business, the general format of that memo is still being used, but usually it's done in an email context, okay? Let's think about this. I mean, like, first of all, why is this even an important topic, right? And, and if you look at this chart, this begins to explain why. On a, on a global basis, in 2019, the last year that I had data for, there were 247 billion emails sent in that one year. That's a unbelievably huge number, 247 billion. Of those, 129 of them, 129 billion were business emails. And then the rest of them were just personal ones. Okay. You know, um, business email growing at a pretty steady rate of about 3% increase every year. And now if we look a little deeper into this, you know, how many are received and uh, that are legitimate and how many are received that are spam, right? We said 127 billion was the total number for business. And about 20% of those 19 19 billion are, um, or I'm sorry, number of emails received. Okay, so, you know, 19, um, 95, I'm sorry, on average, somebody will receive about 95 emails a day. Of those 95 that you might get at work, about 20% of them are spam. The rest of them, the other 80% that you'll get at work are legitimate emails. Um, how many of you guys work in a business environment right now where you're using email every day? I'm going to assume that if you have a job, you're doing email. I am. Yeah, uh, not at all surprised. <laughs> so um, uh, for that reason, a lot of companies have put filters in that, that, that separate out the spam from everything else so that people aren't wasting time looking at spam. And, and for marketers like me, it's a bigger problem these days because we're trying to find ways to get through those filters and get our business messages in front of people that we hope we can do business with, which is a harder and harder thing to do all the time. Now, as email came on, 127 billion a year for, for, for corporate or business use, this is what happened to snail mail. Remember, Zoe, we talked about this term last week. I, I, I taught you what snail mail was. Do you remember? Yes, I remember. It's slow. Yeah. yeah, it's the slow stuff that goes in paper and the guy with the truck drives up to your door every day. Well, you can see that from 1927 through about 1930, all the way up through about the year 2000, 
the old traditional paper mail was, you know, larger and larger every year. Starting around here at 2001, which was the peak year for that, and then going forward, you see this really sharp drop. What do you guys think happened between 2001 and let's say 2012, or it's still occurring? Why did, why did, why did paper mail decline so significantly? The internet. Internet and what? Social media. And, and email. And email. Right? Snail mail was delivered to, you know, to you by a person, you know, and email is coming to you via the internet. So we see in that last year of 2001 was the, la was the biggest year ever for paper or snail mail. And then it dropped off every, every year after that as, and, and this, this actually happens way after that. So you don't really see it in the numbers, but you can understand what happened. Anyway, so here we go. Quarterly changes in total mail volume. It was, if you look at this kind of like on a trend line basis, that's this flat black line in here. If you, if you smoothed out all the highs and lows in annual mail delivery, it was like this flat growth, right? Meaning, you know, the, the increase was about the same every year. It was a flat line. But ever since then, ever since like 01, we said, or right around in here, it fell way off. Okay, this is just another way to look at it. Same thing though. So you remember last year when, you know, they were talking about is Trump going to extend the life of the post office or not? This is why all of that was in the news. It's because for the longest time, since 2006, for about the last 15 years, the US mail is losing money every year. And in fact, you know, here as of 2012, the US postal system lost almost $16 billion. That's a huge loss. So they don't make any money running that service anymore. The last time that they actually made money delivering the mail was way back here again in 2006. So anyway, all of that, all these numbers and things that we just looked at, that's all just simply there to show you how important email has become. It's become so important that the standard, you know, delivery of the US mail went up into question last year. Are we even going to continue this as a thing since mostly all of the, you know, all of the activity has shifted away from paper and delivery through the mail service and gone online? So we have to really understand it because it's going to be a really important part of your guys at work, of you guys at work, at least for the foreseeable future. Meaning that, like when I started, you know, when I graduated college and went to work, this was in 1990. We still actually didn't have email yet. I didn't start seeing email at work until maybe 1992 or 93. So the first couple of years I was at work, there was no such thing. But today it's become everything. And just like it was went from nowhere to becoming this huge deal, I can't predict what's gonna come next. Highly likely it's gonna be something that replaces email at some point. Just kind of, I, I would wait for that in, your, in the time of, during you guys in your careers. But for now, we all gotta learn this. So email is a way to pass messages electronically through the internet. And, and other types of electronic messages that we write or use are IM or instant messaging and texting. Have you guys, do you guys do a lot of texting? Yeah, I just did some earlier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's become like how everybody communicates. In fact, for a lot of people, they're not even doing email anymore and they're doing a lot more with text. Does that feel like you? Is that your life? Yeah. And, uh, my nine to five, uh, we use Bitrix, which is okay. kind of instant messaging, but for businesses. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, so there's that and there's podcasts, which you guys are familiar with. Mostly, I think podcasts are mainly done for 
entertainment purposes, but it's still electronic messages. And wikis, you guys have all seen Wikipedia. Uh, and blogs and social networking. So that's electronic. And then there's the whole other more traditional side about ink on paper. And when we look at that, we can think about business letters that we still have to write to people and inter office memos. So whenever you want something that's gonna be documented and put in an actual file, inter office memos are still the way that we go. And we, and I'm getting a lot of uh, conflicting uh, um, sound guys. Does everybody, if, if you're not, what, what is that? Yo, Marcellus. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Marcellus. Thank you, Marcellus. Okay. So, you know, business letters, right? Whenever you need to communicate with a customer, you can, a lot of us in the casual, you know, uh, moments with our customers, we will email. We might even text. But if it's something like a document, you know, supporting a contract or something that's a very formal communication, we still rely on letters and in our office memos. But email for most businesses has definitely become the way we want to do things. It's the preferred channel. It costs most people at least two hours in every day. I can remember at a time when I was working for this big, huge corporation, and this was back 25 years ago or more, you guys, I was getting at least 100 emails every day, every single day. And so if I was going to be trying to respond to the people who were trying to get my attention and help on things, that could be an all day job responding to 100 emails. So it came a point where we had to find a way to manage it like you were, you know, you were only going to answer, you know, emails at a certain time of day. And then for some people, you had to tell them, you know, for these kinds of issues, you need to go to this person and not me because we had to find ways to get out from underneath this, you know, torrent of, of emails that were coming in or we couldn't get our actual jobs done. Um, emails have replaced paper memos inside most companies. I mentioned that these paper memos have mostly gone away. And we sometimes, like I mentioned before, we will even in some situations use email for letters to customers instead of a formal letter, but not in every instance. Like if it's a contract negotiation or something, you do want to have a formal letter in place. So just some more statistics. I won't take more time on this, but you guys can look at this later if you want. You've got the slides. So with all this stuff happening in email, there's got to be a lot of griping about it going on, right? And so what are some of those complaints? Well, one, sometimes they can be really poorly written because sometimes we don't take the effort in writing an email the way we should, because in our mind, this email is a quick form of communication and we don't do the full, you know, three by three matrix that we've been learning about in here. We shouldn't do that. We shouldn't forget about it. We shouldn't be more sloppy in our email, but some people are. And when they go out like that and they weren't written well, they're also confusing, which is why we don't want to drop the ball. Um, another, tr another problem with a lot of business school grads is that they don't have super excellent writing skills. A lot of people who graduate in business get a degree in finance or project management or accounting or something. Usually the marketing people have really good writing skills because they're writing all sorts of things all the time and they have to be good writers. Like blogs, for instance, um, or ads. You have to write well to do those things. But a lot of functions in business, the, they graduate, they weren't really, the writing skills weren't really drilled into them. And so if they are writing, they're probably writing poorly written stuff that's confusing. And it's not a feather in your cap or a career progression type of a situation for you to be putting out bad material. Also, 
because we've gotten sloppy with in the way that we text using a lot of abbreviations for things and we carry that over into our social media when it comes time to writing email some of us have gotten so used to these sloppy habits that it carries over even into our email and again we have to try to not do these things these are mistakes that people are making not the way it should be and then like i was mentioning in my experience from years ago just the sheer number of them is just overwhelming so how are you gonna if you have to respond to 100 emails in a day or something do you really have time to you know do that you know planning phase the drafting phase and the rewrite phase Probably not, not if you're gonna be efficient in getting your answers out, but it doesn't make it good writing if that happens. So like, um, so like, like texting, like social media, and I think this is probably more true a few years ago than it is now, but for a while email was blurring the line between work in our private time. Meaning that in our private time, you know, um, we will spend time with friends and family and whatever. And if you're at work, they can't communicate with you so easily. They have to call your office and, and whatever. But now if we give the, our you know, professional email address out to people, some folks don't have the discipline not to use it. And so when they talk about email blurring the line from your employer's perspective, if you're doing anything other than working on company business during company time when you're being paid, you're either breaking rules or you're doing something that's definitely not, you know, not smiled on. Okay, so it's something to avoid. Now, messages that are put out in email are just as important from a documentation perspective as are red letters and other forms of communication. Like just because you know you sent this email to one individual, doesn't mean that that's where the email ends. Just as soon as I get anybody's email, I can take that message and forward it to any number of people that I want. And there have even some, been some pretty high profile court cases where people thought that their emails were private and couldn't be used in a public way like in a court and they found out they were wrong. Sometimes they found out they were wrong because they didn't realize that other people had possession of those things and they thought they could just keep it under wraps. You guys know about all the email, for instance, that Rudy Giuliani had to turn over recently or um, that other guy, Michael Cohen, who was uh, Trump's original fix-it lawyer, right? When they broke in, when the FBI went into Cohen's office, they seized all kinds of email. Uh, and, and that was part of why he went to jail because they, were, they found a whole bunch of illegal activity that he was involved in. Obviously at the direction of our uh, nefarious and uh, most hated president, at least in my perspective. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, a quarter of bosses have fired workers for violations. So again, you know, you think it's okay for you to take a minute and send an email, but the truth of the matter is that email, that computer that you wrote that email on and then sent it out was not your computer to use to do that with and you're not to be using that computer for any other purpose other than business. It's not yours, it doesn't belong to you, and you're not supposed to use it for things that are not business related. So when you start you know, making mistakes like that, you're violating company policy and it's a fireable offense in some organizations, especially based on what kinds of things are you communicating using company email. face-to-face -face and phone conversations are also a lot better to have with people when possible than email. Email is one of those things that people can hide behind a lot of the time. If somebody's trying to avoid you at work, you can be emailing them and they don't respond to you and you're never going to get your work done. 
Whereas if you go in and visit them on an appointment, sit on in their office and have the conversation, not only is it more efficient and they can't hide from you, but also you're gonna see their body language, their nonverbal behavior. And that's gonna tell you a whole lot more than what you might be able to pick up simply if they respond to your email with another email. You guys remember that I told you that nonverbal communication is more than 80% of the entire message that we send, right? Do you guys recall I, I mentioned that a while ago? Yes. Yeah, it has to do with your posture, the expression on your face, you know, the tone of voice, and a lot of other visual cues about what you're thinking and how you're feeling about that conversation that we as humans have a really hard time not revealing, okay? So if there are certain times when, you know, we need to email, like when we are, you know, in speaking internally with people that we work with, and certain times when email is not the right thing to do, like when you're trying to communicate with somebody outside the company on a non-company issue, when is email appropriate? When do we want to use it? Well, if what you're trying to do is have very short and informal exchange of, of a message or two, email's perfect for that, okay? Like you could send somebody a request that would say, hey, I need a report about such and such. Could you please run that report and then email it to me? Let's say that you've got an email that you're sending to somebody in your IT department where they run reports for you. That's absolutely great mail to send, okay? If you want to reach a lot of people with a message that you want them to save, you're going to archive that message, email is also great. Whenever I want to reach a lot of people in a short time, one surefire way to do it is to write, a, obviously, a well-crafted email. And then just typically what you want to, oftentimes what you want to do, too, is um, put yourself in the to section and the list everybody else as a blind copy. Why do you think you'd want to do that? Especially if these are not people that work in your same organization. Is that a tricky one? Well, I used to blind carbon copy um, someone who was keeping me accountable. So it's kind of like showing them, look, I, I did send it, so-and-so got it, but I don't want them to know that I also communicated with the boss. That's a great purpose for that. Another purpose could be that the other folks that are on your list may not want everybody else that you're communicating with to have their email address. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's that some people consider that to be pretty personal information. So that's another reason why. So depending on who we're sending it to, if we're sending it out to a large group of people, if they're all within your organization, it's safe to put them all in the to section of that email. If not, think twice about how you're doing it. Now, if you're using email as a carrier to send out a long report, like as an attachment, then you can, uh, instead of having a memo to go along with it that explains what the report is for and what you want back from them having received and reviewed the report, you could use the email body itself to have that communication, okay? So it's a cover document. A little bit like if you were gonna send a fax, you might have the document that you actually want people to receive and then what they call a cover page that actually gets sent first that says who is the next you know, sheet of paper in line supposed to be for and who is the sender and if by accident it went to the wrong fax number, how do they, how do they contact you? So just a cover document like that. So here's, here is an email format, right? The stuff at the top the two, the CC, which means carbon copy, and the third button, BCC, which means blind copy, 
These are all carry in the subject line too. These are all carryovers from the old days when we used to write memos. Because when you write a memo, you've also got these things and the subject date. The other thing that's always here and automatic is the date that the email was sent on. I don't know why they don't show it in this example, but there would also be a date here. And that date was also part of the original memo document. If you're wondering what CC stands for, again, it's another throwback. It used to mean carbon copy. So back in the days when we had, you know, typewriters that had a little uh, cylinder that you would twist and it would actually drag the piece of paper up further through the typewriter machine so that the keys could hit it in the right place. There would be actually two sheets of paper. One would be the paper itself that was going to get sent, but there would also be a second sheet behind it where, an in, where the impression of the letter and the words and the lines and everything that were made on the front page got made like a second copy got left behind so that you actually got an original and a copy by typing one letter. Well, if you think about it, this was really important because we weren't creating these things on Word document software, right? We were creating them and, and there was only ever just the original copy. There was no way to save that unless you had a copier in your office and that's how you saved it. But remember, they had typewriters going back to the turn of the 20th century, even before that, way before there were copier machines available. Okay, so once, once upon a time, long, long time ago, if you wanted a copy of the first document, but you didn't want to type it twice, the way you got to it was with a carbon copy. Now it just means, you know, to all the people here, that's like my primary audience. And CC means basically my secondary audience. Primarily, this email is going to Amelia Rowe. If I had somebody here in CC, it could be Amelia's boss or Amelia's coworker or somebody else. When you put all the names and you make them visible, everybody in the two and the CC are aware that all those people in those first two categories got this. If there was ever a reason, like the one that you know Esme gave us a minute ago, where you wanted to include other people, but you didn't want everybody else to know that you had included those other people, you use blind copy. The reason to call it blind copy is because everybody in the two or the CC is completely ignorant or unaware of the fact that anybody else got it. Everybody up here in these top two rows is totally blind to anybody else receiving this document. This is this, so then there's a subject line. There should be a date in here too, but we're not showing it. Now let's continue down the document. Dear Miss Rowe, there's names to these different parts and we'll get to that too. Please accept this message as notification that I'm leaving my position with ABCD, effective September 15th. So first of all, this piece here is called your, your salutation. You're basically greeting this person and in a business environment, you're gonna say, dear Ms. Rowe, comma. If it's a more formal relationship, like, like maybe you're emailing a customer, for instance, in one of those chances that you do. OK, now this net or it's somebody who's at a level above you and your company culture says you don't call you don't call the people who are in ranks above yours by their first name. I, I don't know. Anyway, for some reason, they're calling this person Dear Ms. Rowe. And this is a salutation here. This is now the subject sentence. Up here in the subject, it says resignation, Susan Sharp. In a really condensed way, these three words, you know, describe everything that this email is about, but in a really condensed way. So we know when we see when we read subject that, oh, this is about 
oh, apparently Susan's going to resign. Oh, and I got that by three things, by three words. But when I get to the subject sentence here, I'm taking this really short blurb and I'm blowing it out with more detail into a full sentence. Here it says, here this, whole, this same idea, resignation, Susan Sharp says, please accept this message as notification that I'm leaving my position effective September 15th. Okay, now this next section in here, these next, you know, from between I and no, this is called the body of your email. In this section in here, we provide more detail, maybe more background, more explanation, maybe a request for something that still has to be done. Maybe you're following up with something, but it all somehow ties back to the fact that Susan is about to check out. So in this body, she says, I appreciate the opportunities that I've been given at the company and your professional guidance and support. I wish you and the company success in the future. Really nice, right? I mean, she's, Susan is bright. She's saying, I don't want to burn any bridges behind me. I want to do this in a class way. And I'm going to start by thanking the person that I've been reporting to for the job that I've had here. And then she goes on to say, please let me know what to expect as far as my final work schedule, my accrued vacation leave, and my employee benefits. So this is really why Susan sent this thing out. I mean, this is really what she needs to get back from Miss Rowe right away. Okay, this is the ask. So she started with explaining that she's leaving. She's making it a nice, you know, friendly situation that she's leaving. And then she comes in for what she really is writing this about, what she needs. And then she comes back friendly again. If I can be of assistance during this transition, please let me know. So, so there's, there's some um, politics going on here, right? I mean, she's making sure that she doesn't burn any bridges. She wants this thing to be a, a nice departure. She wants to make sure that she's covered off on anything that she still needs to do before she leaves. That's why she's saying, if I can be of any assistance, blah, blah, blah. But what she really needs back from Miss Rowe is this thing here, the schedule, the vacation leave, and the benefits. Then you have this um, signature line here, right? The sincerely Susan Sharp, this is her checking out. And then down in here, this is called the signature block. This block here has probably been the same for every single email that Susan has sent out while she's been working for the company. Her first and last name, her phone number, and her email address. Usually, if you're working for a company, you'd also include a couple other things. You'd say Susan Sharp, and then the next line would be, what is Susan's title at the company? And the next line below that could be the name of the company, or maybe in Esmeralda's case, you know, uh, what branch of the military she was in and where she was stationed or whatever, right? Am I right about that? Yes. Yeah. And then the email address. So this is a really short version of what we expect in the format or the structure of an email. Now, soon you guys are gonna have an assignment through MindTap where you have to understand how to structure this, how, how this all flows together. What comes first, what comes second, what's in the body of the thing, what the signature line is and all that. So understanding this format is important, not just for the homework, but it's something that you're gonna to have to know how to use every single day for the rest of your working careers. Something that you just, it's just part of it. So what's the writing plan? Well, I mentioned there's a subject line. The subject line is to summarize the main idea in a condensed form. So let's look back at this again. Here's the subject line, resignation, Susan Sharp. And having just gone through that, you can see that that's a pretty succinct version of what the entire document says. 
you want to avoid meaningless words like help or important in the subject line. Notice that Susan does need some help. And she, you know, and somebody else might have said, I'm leaving the company, I'm requesting your help in the subject line, but that would be the wrong thing to do. We don't do that. We just succinctly, what is this thing about? The place to put the request for help is down in the body of the email. The next thing we had was the opening. I call it a salutation but the other word for it is opening. So you'd say, hi, Lily, semicolon. In this case, the relationship is probably between coworkers. So something informal like that is totally great. Uh, or greetings, Lily, or even thanks, Lily, depending on what's gonna follow. But notice it's, it's succinct, it's short, it's to the point, it's friendly. And in the opening, you're also maybe revealing the main idea immediately, but in an expanded form. Because the next thing that followed in that was the actual subject line. See, here's, here's Dear Lily or Hi Lily, right? That's this, that's this Dear Miss Rowe. And then here we took the subject line, Resignation Susan Sharp, and we expanded on it. We fleshed it out a little bit more to instead of resignation, Susan Sharp, it's please accept this message as notification, blah, 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 blah. More detail. Okay, now we're going beyond the opening and we're looking at the body of the email, right? The rest of the document before we come to the closing. So in the body, the main purpose of the body of the email is to provide explanation if necessary or to justify the major idea. That main idea would have been in the subject line. <clears throat> we wanna make sure that we're grouping ideas that are related to each other in chunks within the body. So if I'm writing a three paragraph body, the, you know, each paragraph should be a nice block of text regarding an idea. When my idea changes to the next subject that I need to address, I have to change paragraphs. If I jumble it all together, it's not the right way to do it. I wanna use headings and bulleted lists and other techniques that help people read and skim the document quickly to make sure they got the full communication without making it super hard for people to follow. Remember last week when we were talking about um, uh, how like in a report you'd have a subject and that might be big and bold and then you might have a, a sub component of that major subject that could be you know a subsection so the changes from the big bold to maybe italicized bold. And then if you have like a sub sub point, you treat that even differently so that people can see a visual representation of what your document outline is. We're doing the same thing here in the body of the email. We're making it easy to look at the email and understand what the different components are and make it easy to get all of the content quickly. Don't be wordy. At the same time, make sure that you're clear. Use as many words as you need to, to convey your point. But if it can be said in five words, don't use 15. That's the point here. Avoid wordiness, but don't sacrifice being clear. And then here we come to the closing. We're gonna conclude with you know, information that could be appropriate, like the action statement with due dates or deadlines. So back here,
please let me know what to expect. You could consider this part of the closing. The way she treated it here, it's really part of the body. But if they had written another sentence here, other than the one that they gave us, if I can be of assistance, blah, 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 please let me know. So let me go back to where we were. An action statement. So if you're writing an email about um, an HR um, uh, communicate, it's an HR communication about a change in the company's benefits program for the coming year. And what you need most to happen is you need to have everybody have their signed paperwork in to HR by November 13th. If that's super important for everybody to do that, you put that in the closing. It's also maybe a summary of the message. That's a closing thought. So if I would, let's go back to my HR example. And, and we're asking people to get their paperwork in by November 13th, okay? I could say, so to recap, comma, we need all employees to uh, complete and submit in writing their selections for the coming you know, uh, year's health plan. Everything must be turned in to HR by November 13th, um, uh, period. And then at the end, you could say, please contact me if, you're, if you have any questions about any of this communication. That could be your closing thought. If you still don't understand what I'm asking you to do, having read this email, please call me. That could be the closing thought. So uh, you also want to make sure that you include all of your contact information in the signature block. So let's go back there again real quick so we can see it. This is all of Susan Sharp's contact information, her name, her phone number, and her email. Okay. I mentioned people are getting sort of buried in email these days. So what do we do about that? Well, we have to control our inbox. And here's some great helpful rules about how to do that. First, always keep in mind that email is business writing. So when I say business writing, I want you guys to think about the three Bs. Okay, the three Bs, you remember this, the three Bs. Be brief, be bright, bright meaning smart, know what you're talking about, be brief, be bright, and most important, be gone, okay? Say what you gotta say, say it well, and get the hell out of there. Is this is business and we don't have time to diddle daddle here, okay? Check your email at set times, maybe two or three times a day. What they're saying here is don't become an email clerk like a lot of us back in the day were, you know, making a mistake of falling into that trap. If you, if you, you know, um, check your email first thing in the morning and get in, maybe set aside half hour for that. Then, you know, right after you come back from lunch and then once more before the end of the day, that's probably sufficient. But how, if you're only going to devote an hour, an hour and a half a day to email and not eight hours, how do you do that? Do you guys have any ideas on, on, how, on what you would do to, to make sure that you're, that you're not becoming an email clerk? Anybody have ideas? Check as a sub subject. Yes. Really good. Look at the subject line. Yep. What else could we do besides a subject line? Who, what else might be super important for us to know as a way to prioritize our email? The like a short, short one, a question mark. Okay, could be. What about, do you think it's important to always make sure that you get back to somebody say like your boss? 
within a short amount of time? Do you want to leave your boss waiting a whole business day before you answer him or her? No, no. no. Right. Let's say that the boss man is out traveling. You know, he's out of the office for a week. You know, you don't see him in the hall, so he can't flag you down and say, hey, Paul, I sent you that email. I didn't hear back yet. What do you think? He can't do that. And what he's asked you for might be really important. Like, hey, Paul, you know, I have a meeting coming up tomorrow, you know, in my next city that I'm going to be in. And I need you to pull a report and email it to me so I can go over it tonight in my hotel room. What happens if you don't see that until tomorrow? I better get ready for my resonating letter. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Esmond, what do you think? You're going to be in trouble, <laughs> for yeah, sure. Yeah, you're going to be in trouble. He's going to say, well, you know, Paul, I'm not going to fire you. You don't need to resign. But, you know, I really needed that information. How come you're not answering your email? I got too many emails. Because I got too many emails. <laughs> so, so here's a really important way around that. If you're only checking your email a few times a day, and that's a smart thing to do, then all of the rest of the time, you should have your um, an automatic message being sent out every time you receive something. You ever heard of that feature in email? It's an automatic reply? Yes. Okay. So this automatic reply should say something like, because I get so many emails, I've been forced to limit the amount of time I spend on it every day. I want to let you know that my review times for email are 8 to 8.30 every morning, 1 o'clock to 1.30 every afternoon, and 4.30 to 5 at the end of every day. If you've received this message, it's because I'm not currently on email. If you need my attention immediately, please call me. You think your boss in that case who is waiting in the hotel room wondering, why in the hell didn't Paul get me that anything? I thought I could count on him. Do you think a message like that sent automatically to him would have tipped him off to let you know by phone that, dude, I need your help on this? Yes, he's going to call me instead. He's going to know what to do. He's not going to be wondering all day, where in the hell is Paul? I don't want to wait for Paul all day. And he's not, he's, he, who knows what he's imagining, right? Did Paul play golf today? Where is Paul? <laughs> or he probably thinks, you know, Paul's a really hardworking guy. He's working on something else, but I sure am frustrated right now that I can't get his attention. So you do yes. this as a courtesy to all of the people that you have to partner with at work all the time. Because, you know, we're not an island at work, are we? Mm -mm. We're a whole lot more like um, a cog in a wheel or a part of a watch, right? It takes all the parts working really well to keep that watch on time, right? Yes. And if any one part of that watch doesn't work, what happens to the company's ability to function smoothly? Breaks it down. Breaks, it breaks down. Fail. So this is how we make sure that we can manage our time without causing a lot of other people you know, a hard time needlessly, okay? So keep that in mind and try to execute that. And then let your coworker, here we go. Let your coworkers know about your schedule for responding for all the reasons we just talked about. And then the last one is apply the two minute rule. What is, do you, do you guys know the two minute rule? It's in your reading this week. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, the two minute rule says this. If it's going to take you more than two minutes to address an email, put it aside as work you're going to do later in the day because it's going to require more than you want to give any particular email. Set it aside and come back to it later. Okay. Now that kind of negates the once and done rule. A once and done says only handle a piece of paper once. Don't start to work on it, put it away, come back, 
do a little bit more with it, put it away. Because that's the procrastinator's dream, right? That's a sure guaranteed fire way to make sure that you're never ever gonna complete that request. So when you pick it up, have the mindset that you're gonna get this done no matter what. So if you open the email and you go, holy Jesus, this is gonna take me a while for me to finish this. It's not an email, it's a project. You come back to it, okay? So you build like a task um, yeah. folder and yeah. just move it as into that folder as a task. And, ma and make sure that you're managing your email folders appropriately too, because if that task, task folder becomes the Bermuda's triangle of all email, <laughs> not a good situation, right? Right. Right. So the two minute rule. The point is to clear your inbox so you don't waste time searching for email. If it becomes a project, file it. If it's a project and you're the project boss, you, do you guys use um, uh, any kind of CRM process at work right now, like Salesforce or Zoho or any of those? Yes. Things? You are. What do you use it for? Uh just pretty much a basic communication between coworkers, and uh, so so we don't have to like if it's not a really official thing, we can just uh, hit them up on uh, the CRM. Yeah, good. That's good. Okay, so with that CRM, if you're coming upon work in your email and you know that you're the guy that's responsible for delegation of tasks in your department. Rather than just sticking it away, it could be just as easily something that you click the right buttons in whatever CRM system you're working so that that email automatically gets put in somebody else's queue. But if you do that, keep this next rule in mind. Accountability and responsibility are not the same thing. Can somebody tell me with a difference between being responsible for something and being accountable for something? Okay, Maureen, <laughs> I know you know this one. How does it work in, 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 that, in that world? Uh, accountability is you, you have to uh, come back, uh, get it, um, supervised and make sure that it's done, that is actually completed. Yeah. Responsible is just like, sure, yeah, I'm responsible for that, but you know, are you actually gonna get it done is something different. Okay, if you're accountable, I think it's actually the flip-flop. I think if you're accountable, it's you've had the task delegated. But just because you, the manager, have done the delegation does not mean that you're no longer responsible for making sure that it gets done. That's the difference. You retain responsibility for having it done, although you may not be the person who is accountable for getting it done. So you're saying the right thing, but the words, I think, in your definition were flip-flopped. I think, unless, you, did you guys talk about it a different way? Well, it's just being, uh, for us, it was just relating to duty and making sure you're trustworthy and, you know, having those, those responsibilities. But yes, uh, accountability, we delegate that. Right. To, but we'd still be responsible, but you're right. Yeah, you know, the, were the generals in any war that you're aware of ever out on the front line? No. Who, but, but who, so then in that case, it was the privates and the sergeants and the captains and those guys that were risking their lives while the generals were back several miles in a tent yep. watching what was going on, right? Yes. Okay, and this is the same thing that happens in management. The VP and the president and the director and all those, you know, uh, uppity ups up there, they're not the ones that are 
physically running the project. However, they are responsible to the board of directors and ultimately the stockholders for how the company performs. It's not excusable to say, you know, that we, we, we lost uh, $20 billion on that last project because we had the wrong um, clerks and project managers and such doing the project. But that, would, would, that would never fly. No. Did you ever hear, I don't know if you, any of you guys I ever heard of an um, accident that, well, not really an accident, uh, what happened off the coast of Pendleton when there were several Marines that um, drowned in an AAV, an amphibious assault vehicle. No. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was reported, I think it was on the news too. So I think it was six or seven Marines that were conducting an exercise and um, just a bunch of things went wrong and they ended up unfortunately drowning. The AAV sunk. And uh, I want to say, I can't even remember if it was like around somewhere between 200 and 300 feet deep. Oh, man. Before they could recover them. But ultimately, uh, the reason why I bring that up is, is not like the immediate bosses were relieved. It was the commanding officer that, that were removed from their positions because of that. Exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's what happens. And so what we're saying to bring this all back to email again, or how do you manage stuff that's in your inbox? The idea is you're going to respond immediately to the email that came in. And then you as the manager, you make the decision. Is this something that you yourself are going to work on? In which case it has to get put into a task folder. Or is it something that you delegate, which is somehow going to be, you know, sent maybe via a CRM or some other system. But even if it is sent off of your desk, responsibility for getting it done never leaves your office. It's, you know, you own it. Okay. Um, if what you've received in your email is something that requires more time than just a response, like I mentioned earlier, you take that and you drop that in your task folder or you put it in your calendar or you do something with it so that even though you don't address it while you're doing email, it's a task that falls on your calendar someplace during your day or the week so that you don't lose sight of your responsibilities. And, and, and you know, this sounds really easy, but when you're in the course of a morning going through your email, you might find 10, 15 of these things that are all needing your time or something to be dealt with. So all of a sudden, if you don't have a system like this, if it's 10 on day one and it's 12 on day two, by Friday, there might be 50, 55 things that if you didn't deal with it appropriately at the time, never got done and now you're in a world of hurt. So managing this appropriately is really the key message here. Again, going back to delegating, do you decide if you're gonna do it or do you put it in somebody else's task list? And then if you do that second thing and it's somebody else's task, remember you retain responsibility. So you in your own system, whether it's a note in your calendar or a message that pops up on your screen on a particular day of the week, or maybe it's simple as a sticky note that you put on your computer screen, something, some device there that reminds you that, hey, you know what? If I'm asking Billy Bob to get this done on Wednesday, and it's only Monday morning right now, sometime on Tuesday afternoon, I have to have a note here to call Billy Bob and ask him how things are going. I can't forget about it. So this two minute rule, spend less than two minutes with every email. And if it can't be handled in two minutes, then do something smart like what we just talked about here. Okay. Well, how do we handle our email? How do we reply? A lot of times you're going to get emails that are going to have a series of questions in them. Have you ever seen email like that? You're at work and you're asked to respond to three or four things in the course of one email? Yes. 
How do you handle it when that happens? I, in my reply, I separate each question and answer under each question. Okay, that's right. They call this uh, 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 down editing, okay? And we'll talk about this next. But down editing means that you're, like you said, inserting your responses somewhere down the page right next to the question that was asked. So that the person who's getting your reply back doesn't have to be going up and down the page to read his question and look at your answer and then go back down again and then look back up again and all of that. Now, what you might wanna do to make it simple for the person that you're gonna send your answers to, to find your answers is change the size of your font or the color of the font or the size and color, or maybe size and color and bold. I mean, there's all kinds of options we have to format text. So the key here is make your answer look different than the stuff that surrounds your answer. So, it's, so it pops out easily and can be quickly found. So, we want, so let's get started. Let's, you know, we, for, to get started, we carefully select, we're, we're thinking about, do we do email? Do we do a blog? Do we write a letter? Does it go out by smoke signal? Do I flash a mirror in the sunshine? How am I getting my messages out there? The first stage that we have to go to is identifying first, what kind of communication do you have? And what type of media that's available is the right fit for your message and for your audience and for the amount of time that you, you need to reply by. So you have to look beyond just, I have a message, I'm gonna send it out, which one do I wanna choose? And really think about the whole picture, the whole communication task, okay? What's your message? How many people? How quickly do you want to reply by? How sensitive is this communication going out? And more. Don't, if, if, if you're beginning to write an email, but you find out that there are other devices or other ways of communicating that would be better than an email, for goodness sake, don't write an email, right? Maybe it's better as an I am or maybe it's better as a social media, or maybe it's better as a phone. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could be better than that email that you were first gonna write. So think through those big issues first. The next thing is only send the information that you would feel comfortable having sent if that information was suddenly made visible to the entire world. Let me give you a, uh, uh, in this me too age that we're living in, let me give you an example of what I once saw somebody, a coworker of mine do. This coworker of mine was going out with this girl at one time that, he, that we all worked with, but the relationship wasn't going well and she ended it, but he didn't get the idea that it was done. And he hounded her. And he hounded her and he became a royal pest. And he started off doing this in phone or in person and then by using his own email. But one evening he was drunk and he sent a message to her again using company email. Ooh. She had had it by that point so she decided to reply, copying the president and the vice president and the director of human resources and anybody who was anybody in that company because she had had it to hear. And in her reply, she said, John, it's been now several months since I ended our relationship during that period of time, I have been asking you as politely as I can to please stop this communication. At this point, I consider it sexual harassment at the workplace. 
What do you suppose happened to John? I don't know, probably got fired. Yes, he certainly did. Yes, he certainly did. All, he, all she had to use were those two words, sexual harassment. Because if the company doesn't do anything about it and they're informed, then who is responsible? The company. Were they going to allow themselves to be jeopardized by this little pipsqueak, John? Not worth it. Not worth it, John. Hasta la bye-bye. And John was gone. Not only was he using the company time and the company assets and harassing a company employee, but that harassed individual made it everybody's business to know. Wow. And that was the end of that. So if you're gonna send something out, you remember the rule, only send something that you would be happy if the entire world saw, okay? Because I don't think John would like this VP of marketing and sales and finance and the CEO to know that he was groveling at the foot of this girl. It was pathetic, highly embarrassing for everyone involved. Okay, now, Zoe made a good point a little while ago. One way that we can figure out what we should open first is to look at the subject lines, which means that we need to get really good at writing effective subject lines, lines that will stop people and get them curious, let them know that they have a personal stake at what's being communicated in the email, letting them know that it's imperative that they look at this thing now, okay? <clears throat> All right, so when we talked about communication theory, we said that there is a sender and a receiver. So now we're turning the tables and we're saying, okay, you've received the email, now you are the sender, you're replying, which makes you the sender. So there are things to know about that. When you're replying, you wanna make sure that you scan all the emails that you received, especially if there's multiple ones from the same person and make sure that you answer, if at all possible within 24 hours, or if you can't do it in 24, let's say that you're on vacation for a week, that's another great opportunity for use that auto reply. Otherwise, people don't know that you're gone for 10 days, that you're on vacation, and they're wondering where in the heck you are with all of the things that you've been asking for, and since when did you start blowing them off at work? And why are you ignoring them? Not Let's say it's an email chain. Do you all know what an email chain is? Something very annoying. Yes, it is. <laughs> very annoying. It started off as somebody sent an email to somebody else. And then that person sent a reply back. And the sender then sent something. It's going back and forth. It's like a game of never-ending ping pong, okay, with answer, you know, reply, answer, reply, back and forth. And, but these chains can also get a lot more complicated. It's not a chain anymore. It's a braid. <laughs> 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 and it becomes a braid when all of a sudden it went from two people to lots of people all interjecting and all jumping in at different points of this conversation, this endless, endless conversation. Now, what happens to somebody who They've been kind of out to lunch. Who knows why they didn't realize this was going on. And they decide to get involved having read the first email, but they go all the way to the latest one and they chime in with their ideas and they didn't read anything in between. It's kind of inserting a bad joke at the wrong time. Yeah, it's or at best, he's complicating the things or he's making everybody roll their eyes and go, Oh my goodness, where has this knucklehead been? We <laughs> got off that subject days ago and we're on something else, although we're all still caught up in this braid, right? We're still doing this. And the thing that he's brought forward now, 
all of a sudden has opened the door to what we thought had already been put to bed at finally. And he's just opening the door again to this thing. Look, let me ask you the first question. Does somebody who does this look at all like they've been paying attention? Not at all. Nope. Okay. Does the person look like what they're contributing is at all useful at this point? No. Nope. No. So was it even worth sending it or did it make the guy who had not been in touch look like an idiot? The latter. Idiot. Okay, so you don't wanna do that, okay? So if you have to follow one of these unfortunate situations, then start at the beginning and read all the way through before you start commenting. Make sure at least you know that the subject is still what it was when it started out and make sure that what you've got to say is still relevant somehow, okay? Now let's say that we're in one of these long things and it's, the topic started off on Monday as sales meeting, but somehow or another, it totally changed to, we're now talking about how one particular project has been going. Should we still be sending this message out? No. Under the original no. subject line? No. No, because no. it's not the subject anymore, is it? No. Now, Anybody who's involved in this communication can actually step up and make the change. Frankly, no one's going to mind that you helped clarify what the topic is. Okay, but just make sure that somehow, if it isn't getting done, that either you or somebody that you think is more appropriate do it. Okay. And then, like we talked about a minute ago, Make sure that in all instances where it's possible that you down edit, which means that you're, now there's two ways. You could do the first thing that as Morella suggested, meaning you go to where the questions are asked and you provide your answer there. The other thing that you could do is to take the questions where that were originally asked, copy and paste them into your email, delete everything that follows your email, clean it up, and just answer the three questions and send a reply. No one's gonna mind if you clean up the email too. If this thing's becoming 55 and 60 pages of email going back and forth, you know that it should have ended a long time ago, okay? When you reply, you start with the main idea. The main idea is the one that's in the subject line. You start with the main idea if it still happens to be appropriate, right? If it's still the idea at all. And if you want to make it possible for people to read your email quickly and efficiently, and you want them to understand the outline of how you arranged your response, create headings and use lists or numbers or bullets or whatever to make it easy for them to, to move through. Okay, so here's down editing. We've talked about this. I don't need to go through this again. Email etiquette. Do you guys all know what the word etiquette means before I get into this? Good manners? Yeah, manners. When you were growing up, uh, you might have even had it in the military. Did you ever go to a cotillion? You, anybody? Esmeralda? Do you know what that is? Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, in some hoity-toity private schools, like the ones that my daughters went to, for instance, um, they taught the kids uh, table manners and how to, you know, behave if you're at an elegant social function or something like that. Like, you know, if you're the guy, do you open you open the door for the girl to walk through? You know, if you're sitting down at a table and you've got a date with you, you pull the chair out so she can sit down easily. You know. Just, just nice behavior, right? Manners, okay? We can find examples of that kind of behavior even in our written communication. We call that, we call that etiquette in a cotillion sense like I was describing, but we can also talk about etiquette here. So one rule to make sure that your manners are right is if you were on the CC or the two end of receiving an email and you think somebody else who didn't get included 
should see the email rather than just taking it on yourself to send it get the permission of the person who originally wrote it before you do okay that person may have intentionally left somebody off the email for really good reasons and if you take it on yourself to make sure that person gets it what that guy was trying to avoid may suddenly musher into a problem that you had no idea was even lurking out there, okay? Let's say that you've got, well, in any, in any case, if it's just business, you know, we can be pretty, uh, in, we can be pretty uh, dry and impersonal in business. But at the end of the day, doing business is still about personal relationships between people, either our coworkers, or our customers, or our suppliers, or something. So a nice way to still retain that personal involvement while writing in a businessy way is to soften the tone by writing a nice opening and a nice closing. Like, you know, dear Peter, you know, dear John, you know, or it was really, you know, dear John, it was super nice to see you at the company picnic last weekend got nothing to do with what the rest of your thing is about, but it's a nice way to open the email. You're just kind of creating positive vibes, good vibes, right? In email, people can't tell when you're telling a joke or when you're being sarcastic. I can be pretty dry sometimes. I've got a pretty dry sense of humor. And if I get sarcastic, if you're with me and you hear my tone of voice and you see the smile on my face and my body language tells you I'm kidding, you don't get offended. But if I do that in an email and you don't really know how to take that weird comment I just made, I could start something unintentionally, some bad feeling that didn't need to be there in the first place. So, even if you like to kid around and joke and use a little sarcasm every once in a while, avoid it in writing. Email is, and the reason for that is because email is not, quote, rich communication, meaning I don't get to see all the nonverbal cues that you're going to give me. All I have are black words on a white screen. Impossible to really know and tell and feel where you're coming from in this kind of situation. We also want to avoid writing in all caps. When we write like that word shouting, maybe you start writing an email in all caps for some reason. The people on the receiving end really do feel like you're being overly aggressive. Why is this guy coming on so hard? Chill, right? And they actually call that shouting because that's the emotional impact people feel when you send an email like that. Okay, let's talk about the closure for an email. We want to end with when something is due, right? Let's say that, you've, that your email has been about a request for a report. The most important thing to you is when are you going to get it by? If it's really important, maybe you end with the due date. Or let's say that you need this person to take a couple of follow-up action steps based on what you've just written in your email. That stuff should flow at the end. Or maybe it's just a nice friendly remark. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing you at next month's sales meeting. For no other reason are you saying that other than just to kind of continue the good vibes that you started at the top of the email. Okay, now the reason that we want to end with due dates or next steps or things is because it is at the end and people have a tendency to remember the things that came last in the communication beyond everything else. That we remember the last thing we saw. Remember the last thing we heard. I can tell you that the thing I remember most about my trip to Spain 
was the last half or, you know, the last hour and a half that I sat in the airport gate waiting for my flight home. It's because that's the last thing I saw. Okay. By the way, this thing that you see behind me here was another place that I saw in Spain. <laughs> okay. Um, so you, you also want to, in your closing, add all of your contact information. Some companies now, because social media has gotten really important for them, especially if they're sending this out to customers or to vendors, include social media addresses to your company's Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Maybe a link to your company website. So your contact information could include your full name, your title, the company you work for, um, a link to your website, and maybe a couple of links to your main social media sites. We want to make sure that before we send it out, we've also gone the last detail and done all of the revision and proofreading and editing that we need to do before it goes out. Make sure it's readable, right? Proofread it for typos uh, or unwanted autocorrection. I find that um, uh, Siri does a lousy job changing words that I actually wanted to use into something that I didn't intend to send. And if I hit the send button too quickly, it's too late for me to catch that. Have you ever noticed that happens in your stuff? Well, I can't talk to Siri. Um, I have an accent, so it, it changes my words too much. It does, it's really annoying, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so we want to avoid that every time we can. And right before we hit send, double check it one more time. Now, here's a great, another tip that's not here, but I would really like you guys to know this in case you don't already. On occasion, have you ever sent an email before you were ready to send it? Like maybe your hand slipped and it hit the send key instead of something else and it went out and you weren't ready and you hadn't proved it yet or you hadn't attached the attachment or you hadn't, you know, you weren't, you weren't ready for it to go out. Has that ever happened to you guys? Yes. Yes. I got attachment. Yeah. So the way that you can avoid that is to not fill in the two line in the email until the very last thing that you do not the two and not the cc because email won't send by accident if those things aren't filled in it doesn't know who to send it to so yeah so so don't send don't i mean don't include those things until you've done your due diligence making sure that that document is exactly like you want it to go out. Okay, here's the top 10 email mistakes that people can make. If you ever wanna shoot yourself in the foot, this is how you do it and make sure that you blow both feet off, okay? <laughs> Responding when angry. Somebody just um, sent you an email that has pissed you off royally. And it's the same person that you were emailing now. The tendency is there to, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna show you, right? And you send this, this, this burner of an email. Is that real professional? Nope. Can that get you in trouble? It depends who you are and who you're telling. <laughs> or who they tell. Yeah. Remember, as soon as you hit send, you've lost the ability to control where that email goes. Making address goofs. There's two guys named Joe Hines in the company, okay? There's Joe Hines in accounting and there's Joe Hines in HR. They both happen to spell their name the same way. You happen to grab the wrong name that could have been easily avoided, right? Now, sometimes you also sent, and let's say that it's worse though. Let's say that the information that you were trying to send was really sensitive, top secret information 
that you were going to send to John Smith, your company's CEO. But by accident, you took that really highly sensitive document and you sent it to John Smith, the janitor. <laughs> that could get you in a world of trouble forgetting a subject line or for failing to or failing to change it to match the thread. When we use the word thread, we're talking about a braid, like I called it when there's a lot of people involved or just two people, it's a chain. If the subject line changes, you need to change the, you know, if the subject itself changes, you need to change the subject line. And if you send an email without a subject line, you've given up your opportunity to make sure that your email gets read first. Because a lot of people are doing what that suggestion said, which is scan the subject lines. So if yours, if yours says nothing, people are probably gonna think, oh, this is unimportant. I might get to it like the 12th of never maybe, right? Not personalizing your message, like just jumping right into the thing without saying, dear John, whatever that kind of comes across really abrupt. Some people could get offended like, or even misread that to say, why are you being so angry today? You know, why didn't you say hi like most normal people do? And we'll take offense where none was meant, but you could have avoided that. Or including inappropriate content, like off-color jokes. Do you know what it means an off-color joke? Racist jokes. Racist jokes are one. Sexist jokes are another. Okay. Like that. Um, or making other comments in that email that you might regret later. Remember, part of that revising process, that stage three, is seeing your document objectively and asking yourself, if I was the person reading this, how would I feel about receiving this email? Okay. If it's anything worse than I wouldn't feel anything, make sure you don't send that. Forgetting to check spelling and grammar. Well, this is a bad idea to do this for the reason that we've been ticking this entire course. Meaning People make pretty snap judgments about our capabilities and our intelligence and our promotability and so forth based on what they can see. And you actually might be the most qualified person to receive that next promotion. But if you habitually send out garbage that you don't proofread, the chances of you getting that promotion are small to none, unfortunately. Uh, copying and forwarding recklessly can also get you in trouble. Um, adding too many people onto a distribution list and copying the world on everything you send out leads people to think a number of thoughts like, doesn't this person know what we all do here? Why is he sending me this information? How dumb can he get, right? Or why did that person, why did this person send it to that guy? That guy can only do bad things with this information, right? So it's about being discreet. It's about knowing how to handle information and how to handle and limit your own communication. Uh, uh, one of the very first companies I worked for, maybe the first company I ever worked for, the guy who was VP of marketing once in a, in a speech he was making made a statement that I always remembered. And he said um, that um, if, he said I, he said, if I can't trust you, meaning the general audience, if I can't trust you with the little things, I don't think I can trust you with the big things. So again, sending information to the wrong people indicates that maybe you're not ready for any more responsibility than what you've already got. Because I can't trust you with the little things. That's something really important to hang on to. Uh, 
finally would be expecting an instant response. Look, if you yourself know in the course of your own day that it's super hard to get back to people on a timely basis because you've got so much to do, then don't make the mistake that anybody else has any easier time than you do. We live on, the problem is we live in a I am kind of world these days where, man, you know, I sent that guy a text and it's been three and a half minutes already. Why is he making me wait for a reply? <laughs> you ever felt that way? No. Okay, good for you. Have <laughs> you, um, have you uh, ever known anybody that's, uh, that's, that's uh, been that like impatient? Yeah. Yeah, a few. Yeah. Um, do they seem like uh, measured and reasonable folks or are you wondering what their problem is anyway? Uh, the latter again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the trouble is we have the, we have the capability of communicating instantly. And, and um, I can remember when they first started handing out laptops at work for us to take with us take home, take on trips. We all felt like, oh my God, the expectation is that we're going to work every night at home and we're going to work when we're in the airports and in the hotels at night as if we don't have enough to do during the day. We felt like we were on a leash. And when they started handing out company cell phones, we felt even more like we were on a leash. <sighs> Can you guys relate to that? Yes. Yeah. And, and I think as a society, we have forgotten how nice it was to be unavailable sometimes and have that be okay, not just okay, but actually expected by other people. We've lost our ability to have any privacy or any downtime. True. And I think it's really sad. Um, you know, I, I, that's just how, I mean, Paul and Zoe, Arlen, you guys, you know, what's your experience been? I mean, you probably grew up in this life, so you don't know anything different. Or, or do you think these thoughts? Wait, can you repeat the question? I was like taking a little bit of a note right now. <laughs> yeah, the question is, how do you feel knowing that other people can reach you anytime they want to and expecting to be able to reach you? Like you have to be available. Oh yeah, that's kind of complicated, especially for high school where I was part of my choir and I was a leader in my choir. So yeah. everyone had to depend on me, especially um, the principal and uh, my vocal teacher, they had to depend on me for everything. And it was kind of like, well, I can't really do this because I have an exam coming up and it was, like for my junior year to my senior year that they were depending on me and stuff like that because the former leaders left so it was kind of like hard at sometimes because sometimes I couldn't make it and they wouldn't understand it because they thought they could reach out to you and you should be able to respond 24 hours yeah later. they will kind of respond to me. they will kind of go to me and be like so Arlene what do you think of this what do you think of that and I'm and I usually just say well you have to discuss it with the whole group it's not just with me I, like everyone has a final decision and and I find it odd actually that faculty were leaning on a student so heavily you know I, that, that strikes me as really odd but I guess there are weird people out there you know, but a lot of weight to put on one person. Um, Paul, how about you? I think because I started working when I was like early age. So somewhat I'm, I'm kind of used to it. Like people reach out to me even like middle of night. Uh, one of my previous job was I was regional manager um, to handle Canada and especially East Coast side. So people who contacting me is I'm at like 5 a.m. I barely wake up and I, I they call me on my cell, so I had to check, uh, which was, it, it gets overwhelmed uh, over the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think I personally feel like we need to get back to more realistic expectations, you know? Yeah, but like, like you mentioned now, like when we don't really have a downtime 
And when people judge you by, if you have a downtime, if you like take your time to you know get back yourself, um, put yourself together, mm -hmm. they kind of look at you as you're failing on your job or you're uh, you have a lack of your skill yeah. or something like that. Oh, How about being sick? How dare you get sick? I know exactly. <laughs> yes, you cannot use a sick day. I haven't took a vacation for four years. If <laughs> and you'll feel better. Oh, you really haven't? No, I haven't. Oh my god! I haven't took a single day. No. Man, you need a you need some downtime, brother. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so in, expecting an instant response is a problem that a lot of people have, and and I think that it's that it's becoming a bigger problem all the time. Okay. Memos. What we're gonna see here is gonna be a lot like what we've already talked about under email because memos have, I mean, emails have kind of replaced memos, but we'll go through it quickly anyway. We use a memo if the message is maybe too long for an email. An email should ideally be once, one screen size large, meaning you shouldn't have to scroll a long way through to read the entire e you know, email. Whereas memos can be multiple pages. Or if you need a, a record, a hard copy record going in a file, a memo does a nice job for that. And it's better than an email. Now I've also known in my career, people that printed off every single work email they ever received and filed them in binders. I mean, these people were just, I thought they were a little nutty. You know, but um, I, I, you know, I don't do that. If what you need is a sense of more formality, like it's a um, it's a document that you're using to support a decision to give somebody a promotion, or unfortunately, sometimes you're documenting their performance so that you have an easier time laying them off. A memo is a good document to do that with. Sometimes you're in companies still today that are pretty low tech and the employees don't have email. In this case, no, I, I really have a hard time anymore thinking that there's a whole lot of these out there, but this is what your writer says. Now, like I said, memos and emails have a lot of things in common. They're good for sending information that you don't mind if it gets out to a broader group of people, if it's not very sensitive information. They're gonna have guide words, like the ones like to, from, subject, date, etc. They'll be organized in ways that make the reader, that give the reader an easier time making their way through the document and understanding the outline of the document. So headings and bullets and enumerated items, meaning numbered bullets. So I am is an, and texting is another example, okay, of short, fast, to the point communication like email. A lot, texting has a lot of benefits to it, right? Like you can communicate in real time in places where you may not be in an office with a computer right in front of you, or you may be, you know, not even have a laptop in front of you because both of those require that you have a desk. But what if you're just like walking through an airport? Is it super easy to break out your laptop and look at your email? Before they had email on cell phones and all you had was texting, you know, email was a problem, right? So also being able to quickly share information allows quick decisions to be made by people who are on the go. And usually they're pretty informal kinds of decisions. Let's say that you and your boss are on a business trip together. You decide that you know one airport is more convenient for you to leave from, but your boss lives in a totally other part of town and he's gonna leave from the other airport. And you guys both agreed to meet in let's say you're going to Chicago. You get there first, 
By the time your boss has arrived, you'd like to know if he's there so you know where to meet. So you send him a quick text. Where do you want to meet? That's a quick decision. Let's meet at the car rental agency, for instance, okay? Now you both have made, you've been both in contact without an email, quick informal decision, boom, you're ready to go. So it's nice, simple way to handle it. We can also get away from lots of voice calls using text without bothering a whole lot of people. Let's say that you're in a crowded room and you're having a conversation with somebody and you'd rather not let everybody else overhear the conversation. You can still have that conversation by texting, right? Um, if you send messages and there's no need for the phone tag game, you leave a message, the other guy leaves a message when you're away from your phone and he leaves his message and so on, texting avoids that. Um, people become more productive because they're able to do more than one thing at a time. I can be in the airport and still answer a response or a, a, you know, a texted question that came in from my office. So I can be walking to the you know, car rental uh, uh, desk without me having to stop and get on the phone and call the office to respond to the question that, you know, that might've come in several hours ago. I can just deal with it right now. Um, same or, some organizations have banned IME and texting for several reasons. They're distracting. There's, it's very hard to put a firewall around text. So it makes leaking information a lot more likely. There's also a legal liability from a worker's improper use of that mobile device. I told you about that guy, John, at my old job who contacted that girl that he was supposed to be leaving alone. He did that using a desktop computer and email, but he just as easily could have done that using his company provided cell phone. Had he done that, he would have been equally guilty and ready to be fired. Have you guys heard of um, phishing schemes or spam? Well, phishing schemes, but never heard it called spam. Well, a phishing scheme has more to do with things that's happening on your computer, but they can use spam to break information out of your cell phone and sending it through IM. They're the same general idea done different ways, okay? Um, just like email, stuff that's passed through texting can still be used in court of law. Um, you have to absolutely make sure that nothing that came in on your phone can ever be used that could be breaking a broker client confidentiality, right? Let's say that I'm passing information to my um, investment uh, guy. And in there, there are some pretty, you know, sensitive data like my social security number and uh, the full bank account number and maybe the number that goes to my, um, you know, uh, you know, stock account or my mutual fund account or something, Invesco, for instance. If, if that ever got out in the wrong hands, a lot of people could get hurt and if it got out of hands because it left the broker's phone, the broker is actually legally liable. So you never pass that information by text. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but smartphones can actually be hijacked and used as listening devices and, and basically spyware. Do you guys know that? Yes. That, that's, yeah, the big companies do that. No, uh, I don't know. I don't think big companies necessarily do that. I mean, like they're not intentionally uh, uh, reversing somebody's smartphone so that it becomes a live microphone. Instead, you, you could this guy, somebody could be sending information over his phone 
without even realizing that his phone is even engaged. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's scary. Uh, yeah, Facebook does that. Facebook does that, you say? Yeah. Uh, anytime you talk about a certain topic, uh, you'll get advertisements for those. Oh, that, that's not what we're talking about here. You're talking, what you're talking about is um, um, a, a, a cookie that gets dropped that's... on your hard drive. Yeah, but they, it... can, they do track your location and everything. Um, uh, yeah, and your mic. Like right now, if you say cat a lot next to your phone, uh, probably for the next couple of days, you'll get cat advertisements. Is that right? I yes. was not aware of that. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's beyond cookies. Okay. How do you think a social media conglomerate makes money? Mm -hmm. Ostensibly through advertising. However, apparently yes. it's a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a technology company now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is a setting on your phone that you can, uh, it, you have to really dig down, but you can actually shut off all tracking. Uh, Oh, so supposedly, you know. Wow, that's good. <laughs> I'm look for that. Okay, so we can also um, uh, other things that are risky is you know bullying and sexting. We're all we're all familiar with this. And my wife's a school teacher in a high school in Whittier. She teaches at a place called Lacerna. And um, a, a few years ago, there was a social media app going around specifically for the purpose of bullying. I don't know if you guys had heard about that. Mm, I've heard of some uh, variety of things to include uh, trying to get kids to to do stuff that they shouldn't be doing. But oh, wow. uh, yeah. The latest thing like that that's going on is um, there are there's a, a whole uh, activity on campus where social media is uh, encouraging kids to vandalize the schools. Oh my God. So they had an instance of this last week at her high school where a bunch of boys went into the bathroom and destroyed the toilets and the sinks and the tile on the walls. Wow. Pretty bad. Of course, the, the thing is, they're supposed to do this and then take pictures and then post it on this site, you know? That's how you get social media points on this app. Well, the boys were real clever because, you know, they knew that they were in a bathroom and there's no closed circuit cameras on the bathroom, but they weren't really bright enough to remember that there's a camera just directly above the door leading into the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> So it only took about a few minutes before they knew exactly who had done the damage. Wow. Oh yeah. Okay. So what do you do? You know your company's rules and you follow them. Isn't that simple? And you don't ever put sensitive information out over your phone and you steer clear from harassment and discriminatory content. You know, there's been so many cases now of young kids committing suicide because of the social pressure that they get in the schools and the nonstop bullying that they take. It becomes a situation where no place is safe for them to get away from the bullying. And somehow their parents are too dumb to take their cell phones away from them so the kids have to constantly be watching all the crap that's being said about them by you know their uh their colleagues at school and and it comes to the point where life isn't worth it for them anymore and they end it yeah it's terrible it's terrible um you know um if you're going to send links and photos and videos and art around, be mindful of whose phone you're doing it with. Be mindful of the content that's actually in those things that you're sending around. And uh, uh, for instance, even if it's on your phone, sending pornography around, for instance, is illegal, whether it's yours or somebody else's. 
phone. Even in uh, what you think is an innocent picture may not be. Uh, right. Because we, there was a uh, one Marine that sent another Marine a picture of a car. At least he downloaded it. He thought it was just a car. And then next thing he knows, he's got NCIS at, you know, at his door. Well, it turns out that that photo, if you um, opened it up like more, I don't know how, but you opened it up more, it was composed of small uh, pictures of child pornography. No. Yeah. So that he had no clue. Once they saw that he really had no clue, they, they let him go that he, he didn't know. But it was a, a vehicle picture. Crazy. Finally, don't ever say anything that could damage your reputation or your company's reputation, right? We, we've already talked a lot in this class about what is our personal brand. You know, um, be always thinking about that because anything that you send around, you think it's funny. What you think is funny, the next person who receives it could find incredibly offensive. Okay, don't text while driving. That's about the same thing as saying, don't drive at high speed into a brick wall, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, separate your business contacts from your personal ones. Make sure that you don't have personal contacts on your company phone. That's what that means. Because having that, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Having stuff like that on your phone is probably a violation of your company's rules not to use the phone for personal reasons. And by you having those contacts there, you're basically admitting that that's what you're doing. Don't chit chat. Well, this is the same thing like don't write really wordy business documents. People are there for a purpose. Let them get their work done. Or the three B's, be brief, be bright, be gone. And if I aming or texting is allowed at work, minimize it. You want to be the guy that's thought of as really serious about your work, but when it's playtime, it's playtime. Don't be the guy who's perceived as this guy never knows when it's time to get to work. If you're busy, put your phone on send calls or turn your phone off especially your personal phone. If you need project time or me time during the day that you set aside every single day so that you can get your projects done, go offline for a while, it's okay. But when you do it, let the rest of the world know that you'll get back to them at your three times during the day My wife has a friend of hers. Uh, they grew up together. This gal is um, not very socially uh, sophisticated. I mean, she kind of has a little bit of an Asperger's uh, thing about her. And if, if my wife and I are out, you know, doing something, this girl will call and Karen will ignore it. Well, that's not enough for this other girl to get the clue. She'll call and she'll call and she'll call like seven or eight times in a row, even though Karen's not picking up. Wow. Really super, it's like she just never, never figures it out, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with your texts. If you're trying to reach another coworker during the day, you think what you've got is super important that the other person should interrupt themselves put yourself in that other individual's position. If what you were working on at a particular moment was super important and you couldn't be interrupted, would you want to have some other pest knocking on your door and not getting the clue that it's not the moment right now? No. Nope. That's, that's what happens when you send a bunch of text messages or you know a bunch of phone calls in a row refusing to get the clue that I'm busy right now. You get blocked you get blocked. 
for the same reason that we don't want to use slang or words that not everybody at work understands, even though they're correct words for an industry. We call that jargon. Don't do this in most of your communication because it leaves people out and it'll confuse people. And remember, one of the most important things we have to be when we're communicating at work is clear. So do you know go what ahead. Do you know what they're calling, uh, literally, what they're calling white people on social media? No. So in order to write it and not get um, get caught, I guess, uh, they're writing YT. I thought it meant YouTube, but apparently it means white person. It means whitey. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. YT. That's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> I get it. Hey, my, 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 my uh, Filipino wife told me this joke the other day. I thought it was very funny. Uh, I don't think anybody of you guys will be offended here. It says, what do you call a girl from the Philippines doing sit-ups? No clue. A manila folder. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Manila phone. Care about correctness. Yes, it's only an email. Yes, it's an IM. But it's work. So don't prove yourself to be sloppy sometimes. It goes back to what that guy at my first job said. If I can't trust you in the little things, I can't trust you in the big things. Yeah. If you're branding yourself, you are smart all the time, not just sometimes. It's your brand. Okay, that's enough. There's a few other things in this chapter that you guys can review, but I think that's good for tonight. Um, I've been, I want to talk about assignment one. I've, I've almost got all of the stuff done for that and ready to turn back to you. Um, mostly it was all uh, very good. Um, some folks still don't quite understand the, um, uh, what I meant by what does success look like or what are your personal goals? Some people thought I was looking for a big write up on what they wrote about and summer, what they read about and summarize that. And also, you know, what, what, kinds of things should be included maybe when you do goal setting and that wasn't it i want to know personally for you you telling me what goals do you have for yourself professionally what professional goals do you have for yourself over the next year three years and five years So do you want us to rewrite it or? So, yeah, so that's what I, because it's a starting point for the rest of the project. So what I've done is for, for folks that made that mistake, I basically have not graded it. And I've, and I've sent a note back to say, I'd like for you to rethink this because I don't think you understood still what I was looking for. But all I'm really asking for is, hey, you read these articles, it made you think about a number of things connected with this. And now that you've had some time to think about it, put yourself into the situation. What do you, in your life right now, what do you hope to achieve on a professional level in the next year, three years, and five years? Okay. Got it. Okay. Do we all do we all get it now? Yes. Okay. All right. It's just all about you. So, like for instance, you guys, just so that you hear some of you know, like if I were to write it, I'm 56, right? So what I would say, and I'm currently looking for a job right now because my last contract ended a few months ago. So I would say in the next three months, hopefully not more. I want to find a job in my field doing marketing, preferably in the education industry, you know, making a certain amount of money. 
That's my goal right now. In five years, I'll be 61. I'll be pretty close to being ready to check out. Okay. I still feel like a kid, you guys. I tell you, I kid you not. I really feel like a kid still, but the rest of the world is telling me it's time to retire. Anyway, um, in the next five years, I want to have taken that job that I got into. I still want to be in it. I would have liked to have been promoted a few times, making a little bit more money. And I really want to be able to sock a lot of that money away for my retirement that's coming up right around the corner. So those are two goals that make sense for me and my life. Okay. But we're not writing about me. And I'm not, and I'm not really, you know, interested in what the people who wrote those articles said were necessarily important for their careers. I want to know for Zoe and Arlen and Zane and Freddie and, you know, Marcellus and I have done some work together already. So he's done what I needed him to do. But for the rest of you guys, I want you to tell me in your world, in your life, what you want. Okay. Awesome. Now, now is that more clear than last than the last couple of weeks? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. I've tried to say that a few times and I'm not at all impatient. I just want to emphasize that, that if you guys still are confused after right now, please call me. You guys all have my phone number and let's talk some more. I think this is a simple request. I think it is. I know it's hard to do it. I don't think I could have done it had I not lived the last 30 years at work, right? I mean, I've been doing this for a while, but at least in theory, Paul, do you, do you, do you understand now what you could tell me right now, probably, you want to finish your education. You want to get some sort of an entry level management job. You probably want to get married in the next few years. You're probably looking forward to buying a house. I mean, are all those my, those are my guesses. Does that work for you? Yes. Is those are probably my goals. <laughs> exactly what you said. Yeah. Well, think about it in more detail, put more detail around it. Like I, you don't want just a job in an industry. You want this job in a particular industry making a certain amount of money, living in a particular neighborhood, maybe marrying a certain kind of a person, raising a number of different kids, you know, doing certain things as if you know, you know, daydream about your life. What do you want? Maybe so you, said, you said that you want personal and um, personal and professional goals. I want your goals, your, but, your, but your, those personal goals though, are important for you to think about when you're thinking about your profession. Because if you told me that you want to buy an eight bedroom house in <laughs> Bel Air on, you know, on a five acre ranch with 50,000 square feet of space inside the house and an indoor Olympic sized pool, if that's what you want, but you also say you'd like to be the manager of a Dairy Queen, I'm going to tell you that your career goals and what you personally want out of life are majorly disconnected and that either your lifestyle goals or your professional goals have to change. Do you see how they're both related now? Yes, I do, yeah. Because anything that you want in life, no, not anything, everything you want in life has a price tag stapled right on the side. Yeah, and, and, and if you're choosing a particular career path, can you afford that lifestyle? Or if you, and if you don't know the answer to that question, then that's one of the things you're going to have to determine during the course of this project. So the idea at the beginning here was, what do you want in life? What do you like to do professionally? Write those things down as the starting point for the rest of the project. Because by the end of the project, you're gonna have researched a whole bunch of stuff related to that question. And you'll be able to say, I have to make some changes in what I want, either in the work I wanna do or in the life I wanna have. And if I'm gonna change the work I'm gonna do, what are my options?
which of my options are going to get me closer to the life that I want to lead. So it's, it's actually a very, very important for you set of questions that I'm asking. And I'm asking it as your teacher, because I don't think probably too many teachers have ever asked you that question before. So you're probably going to school, not really certain why. And the reason why is so that you study the right stuff and do the right stuff now so that you can have the life you wanna have down the road. But you gotta get work. If you want that life in the future, you have to start now working towards it. That's, that's, that's the big picture here. And I wanna help you guys discover what that is. Makes sense. Awesome. Okay, you guys, um, wonderful to meet with you as always. Arlen, after we've just done that, do you and I still need to meet or do you feel solid now? Um, I feel like I should stay a little bit of a few minutes after class. Sounds great. Okay, everybody else, I'll see you uh, next week. Uh, next week, we'll do chapter six, but you'll also have the exam. All right, you guys, bye. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. See you, you Professor. See you later, Zane. Bye. Bye. Okay, talk to me, girl. Um, I just, I, okay, so I'm a little bit of a visual learner and I like learn more, a little bit more if like there's examples of how it's done, the assignment sometimes, so I can get an idea of it and I can do it right and correctly. Well, okay, I'm not sure what to give you visually. I mean, I have any, I can share my screen and like, yeah, I can make do that. a template. Do that, do that. Let me make sure you can share a screen. Yeah. So I can make a template and I can do everything correctly. I love that. I love, cause I don't want to keep making you, you know, walk in circles. Right. Yeah. Cause I, I like I did, I read the assignment and I was like, Oh, well I have to do the bullet points and stuff like that. But I, 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 I obviously it was wrong. That's okay. No, you did the bullets. Well, it was the part that you wrote afterwards that wasn't on the mark. Oh, okay. I think, I think if I'm remembering it correctly. Now I'm having, I don't know why I can't share, make, give you the right to share a screen. Uh, let me see what I do here, hang on. I'm gonna stop share. And why don't you try and share now? Uh, it's disabled, so. Okay, so how um, about this? Try it now. Uh, yes, I can, yes. I can, yes. So we, yes. So if anything, this is this is blank. So we're starting fresh a little bit. Um, but for the like the first part, do I write like as I did before, like all seven articles and bullet points? No. For this part that we're talking about, for this goal setting part, is this is all I want to chat with right now. Let's just talk about the goals first, okay? Maybe, maybe uh, start with um, work goals. Like what kind of, like what industry would you like to work in? I would like to learn, like to learn in um, any company, like in a big company, like a business company, preferably since I am going for a business major. Yeah, so, uh, it, so that's in the next year. Okay, so um, uh, I'm talking about long-term. Long term, oh, long. after you've graduated, after you're at work, what do you have an industry that you're really interested in? I'm a little bit interested in um like big companies, like gaming companies. A little bit interested like, or a lot interested? Like I'm interested in the gaming companies mostly because I grew up with video games and I see how like they address things in the public and like business wise and stuff like that. And I think it's really cool. Yeah. Okay. So, so write that down, you know, so video games, right? Video industry, video game industry. And what kind of work would you like to do for a video game company? Um, as an advocate, um, as a team leader as well, 
and as a manager for it so I can say what goes in this and that and evaluate and discuss with the team and stuff like that. Do you want to be on the selling end or the designing end? I think more on the design end, designing end because I'm more creative in designs because I have more of a creative mind a lot and I like using it for designs and stuff. So do you have the kind of brain you think that that could do computer programming? Yes, I did a little bit of computer programming a little bit throughout high school. Okay. All right. How's your math skills? My math skills are great. I cashier oh, for a living, so they're immaculate. Really? So like the advanced math, like um, uh, calculus, algebra, geometry, yes. all that? I went, yes, I took pre-calculus last year for oh, high good. school. So you might be an excellent uh, um, uh, programmer for this kind of stuff thing, because that's the kind of chops you need to have in math, really, really strong math. Okay, so let's, so then maybe you're saying that you'd like to be a video game programmer. Because to be, to lead projects, you you have to be somebody that can relate to the programmers, right? You have to maybe be a programmer. They're not going to hire you out the gate right after school to lead projects. They're going to hire you to be a person working on a team, developing part of a video game. You know, you, they're going to give you, you know, smaller responsibilities to begin with. No, yeah, yeah absolutely. I put programmer. This is one of them. Also a designer. Pop. Okay. Now, where would you like to live? I would like to live out, out, not maybe, not outside California, because California is kind of my home. It's kind yeah. of like it's home for me. Yeah. So maybe like in San Diego or um, a lot of times, a lot of companies are like out, like in San Bernardino or um, San Jose or anything like that. Where is the video game industry located? It's mostly located, um, from what I remember, it's located a lot in Los in California, but it's in San Bernardino a lot of times. Game companies. That's where, that really. That's where their offices are. Yeah. Oh my God! I feel like I've said it wrong. I don't know if that's right or not. You're teaching me. I have no idea what the right answer is. Let me take a quick look so I can. Well, you, so you, I can you, don't, you don't need to do the research now. Just oh. figure out if, if you are working in that industry, that probably means that you're going to have to live where the companies are. Yeah. So that'll be part of that. So I can eliminate this and be like, um, uh, so I could leave those two as like long term goals. But oh, should I just bullet point like this or? Should I keep going? Well, let's. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the things I want you to think about. I'm not telling you how to write it, Arlen. That's up to you. What I'm telling oh, okay. you right now is the issues that I think you need to think about. Okay. Mm. What kind of money do you think you need to live on? What kind of a lifestyle do you want to have? I think it has to be moderate like a moderate lifestyle. Like I can have a house, like a two, like not a two story, but a two story house ideally, but also have like a good management of my finances and have a good credit score and have a good, every, have a good financial like situation that I'm in right now and meant and get stable. So those are great goals. So I'll tell you right now that in Orange County, for instance, since we're in Orange County, the mm -hmm. average price for a home in Orange County today is about $800,000. Almost a million dollars is the average price for a house in Orange County. Then I have to look for more houses, not in that area, but like maybe a little bit outside of the area because a lot of out of state houses aren't that expensive as well. They're like a thousand to three thousand dollars. If you're outside of the state, but then if they if you're gonna be a programmer for a video game mm -hmm. company does that job i mean these are the things you're going to have to learn about right but does that job give you the income that you would need to live in a three bedroom family home in orange county where the video game companies are like i know that blizzard entertainment is in Orange County. 
So, you know, so those, that's another thing to think about, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, how many kids do you want to have? Probably two. <laughs> okay. So, and those kids, do you, are you going to want to send them to college? Absolutely. Okay. Do you want to send them to a state college or a private college? Um, if anything, I feel like both, if I can provide both for them, both privately and, and publicly, I don't mind it. But as long as they're wise about their decisions and everything, then that's perfectly okay if they choose private or public. Well, if they went to a private college like USC, the price at USC these days is $75,000 a year. A year. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm, what I, so I guess what I'm saying is you want to think about size of family, where do you want to live? How do you want to raise your family? What, you know, what kinds of things do you enjoy doing? What, you know, what, what kinds of skills do you have that you're good at? And, and think about it, maybe a, a, a job or a career that could support that kind of life. Yeah. Then you go, okay, if, if, if I need to make this kind of money, does that job support my lifestyle? Yes. Right. And, and um, how many years of school do you need to have in order to work in that career? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so it, it, this, this, this requires that you kind of think through the future life you want to have and kind of have an understanding of what that might cost and put that over here in the corner. And then the next thing you do is to say, okay, that, that my life, I want this. That's the cost for that. Number two is what am I good at? I'm good at math. I'm good at languages. I'm good at working with other people. You know, these are the things I know about you. So how could you use those skills? What sorts of jobs could you qualify for with the things that you're naturally good at? Um, the skills I'm really good at is leadership skills because I like to take charge whenever there's something that I know I'm familiar with a lot. So I like yep. to take a I like to take a leadership position in that, and I like to say my perspective on this, and I like to say a lot of things that are on people's minds as well, and but also let them exp also tell them to me what's happening and stuff like that, so I can become a better leader in some ways. Okay, all right, and I also. Yeah, and and also I speak both two languages. So if I, if, so I'm a great, I'm a more of a, I speak both languages very fluently, and I think that's a good skill to have because most um most of California has Latinos and stuff like that. Sure so does. I can help if, um a lot of Hispanics. So if anything of Hispanic family comes to a company meeting or anything like that, and they can't. Speak really speak the language I can help them like translate for them or help them as best as possible that's right that's good so um leadership is is one of is an important area so think about the kinds of jobs where leadership is really important I can think of lots of jobs where leadership is important management but also you know public service like in the police force I mean just as an example I'm not saying that's what you want that's just a place where leadership has a role, right? Or you could be, you know, yeah. um, you could be a counselor in a school because the kids are looking to the counselors for some leadership, right? You could be, um, well, leadership goes everywhere. There's almost no place where leadership is important. Skills and language. Yeah. How could, where could you go to work with those language skills? What could you do with that? You know, you would like, maybe you would like, I go ahead. Um, most of like language skills can go for schools, work, um, for example, customer service, you know, like sometimes on the phone, my mom has to be like, um, can you speak in Spanish? And like, oh, we're going to send you to another person. That person helps my mother. So if anything, that's actually very helpful. Mm -hmm. that's and good. that could be an, yeah. No good. And an outgoing 
is a, also a good skill to have because I'm very outgoing and I'm very passionate to like the things I like and stuff. So that will help me a lot in um, terms of having a good environment with the staff and everything with my outgoingness. I can um, go, I can go try things with them and and be a, a member that's not very that's not rude or anything like that, but more of a person for them to be comfortable with me and for them to explain things with me as well and not in the intimidating factor. So so what we're doing here right now, talking about what's what you're good at and how you could use those things at work, but also we're talking about what you might like to have in your life when you're growing up and you know and you've got your own life and your family and where you're living. All of those things that we're talking about, that's the brainstorming that I was talking about. So so what you need to do here is have a good long think with yourself going through all these things and kind of imagining how you could use these talents that you've got in a working environment where you fit, where you think you fit. And then thinking about, well, which of these jobs is going to give me the income that I'm going to need to support that sort of a lifestyle that you envision that you're imagining. So, so it's a lot, it's just about thinking creatively. I can't give you a template or a form for it. It's, it's, it's a lot more about you just daydreaming, brainstorming, you know, pulling as much. Oh, I'm so good at that. Oh. Sorry? You're what? I'm so good at that. I'm so good at daydreaming. I'm okay. so good at daydreaming. Well, that's good. So that means that you can do this exercise. You just need to you just need to take the time to really think through these sorts of issues. And that's why I wanted you to read those articles in the beginning. Because reading those things, I was hoping was going to get the wheels turning in your mind to start having certain ideas pop up as you related to what you were reading about. So maybe it would be a good idea for you to go back through the notes that you took, those bullets that you wrote down. That's why mm -hmm. I asked you to take those notes in the first place, mm -hmm. is to kind of put yourself back in the thought of what you read about and how much of that kind of meant anything to you personally at all. And then use that as sort of a sounding board to relate or, or begin to make some sense some plans out of all this daydreaming that you're doing okay so i did the assignment correctly by bullet point article one article two and stuff like that i just did bad on the last part that's the most important part that's the most important i'm not part. gonna lie i want to be very honest it was in a rush <laughs> I, I yeah that's okay um, but but uh, you got to take the time to do it because if you don't, yeah. And I tried to emphasize with that you before, have a have, you know think through these things and then sit down and set yourself some time to really seriously think about what you read about. Seriously doesn't mean you rush through it. Seriously means that you take the time to think about this is me and my life and my future. You don't want to rush through that. It's you, your life, your future. Give yourself the time that I'm trying to provide you now with this assignment I'm giving you to put some form around this. You can't rush through it. You have to work through it. Yeah, absolutely. So I can leave the long-term goals in the assignment if I can turn it into you and bullet point everything else and then your bullet, write your bullets yeah don't worry just work on the goals right now work on that second part the the bullets that was just supposed to be note taking for you if you sit down and read something and you take notes while you're reading it means that you're reading slowly enough to be thinking about the notes that you're taking it means that you should be thinking about what you're reading and and you know, making it have some kind of a personal meaning to you. Not just these are words on the page and things somebody said, but now that I've learned this, what does it mean to you? But now that you've yeah. learned this, what does this mean to you in your life and how are you gonna use it? 
that's the yeah point. yes so if anything i'm gonna i'm gonna say this oh i'm sorry um if anything I, as you need to be as a, as the article as the articles so i do the note taking correct so first i note the goals my long-term goals are, and then i write a take a note take and then i write my my idea my goals based on what they said and stuff like that and there's two pieces to this the first piece was read the articles and take notes and think about what you read about that was mm -hmm. the first piece just so that you had some background to start doing part two which is coming up with your own goals for your own life sometimes in order to start coming up with things that are new to us it helps to have a background what did other people say about this already now now that i've read what other people think what does that mean to me now that i understand how i feel about what they said i am in a better position to start writing my own goals down Oh, so, oh, I never included that part. I just included what they were saying. I don't really, stuff. I don't really yeah. care so much. I, I never did the other part where No, I you didn't. Arlen, listen really close. Listen really close. I don't really care what those other people said. The thing that I care about is you. What do you want in your life? And I only gave you those articles so that it would get the wheels in your own head turning. What I want most to know is what goals do you have for yourself? That's where I want the majority of all of your time and effort spent. Are you with me? Okay. It has to be yeah it has to be up to three pages correct yeah two to three right. yeah pages? and i want to know all about what you would see for yourself in your life what kind of life do you want to live oh and what kind of work are you going to do that's going to support the kind of life that you want to live okay so tell me that oh. back in your own words if you can tell it to me in your words, I'll know that you understand. So, so I, so I take notes based on the articles, and I write and I write their notes. So I note take the articles correct, and I write what they. I don't write what they. I just say what they were saying, like what points were they making and stuff. That's it. And, and, and you only and listen and remember why I'm asking you to do that. A man to, so to create our own goals and to so brainstorm. Listen, so that you are paying attention to what you're reading. That's all. And you're giving me your notes so that I know that you were paying attention to what you were reading. You're just showing me the notes you took. That's yes. all you're really doing. Yes. I don't need you to write anything more elaborate except for the bullet points. I don't want anything else. Okay. What I really want you to spend most of your time on is thinking about yourself. How do you want to live your life moving forward? When you're an adult out of your parents' house living your life, if it was the perfect life, what would that look like? What do you have? What have you achieved? And, okay. and then you think about your career. Three, and, and the career is the thing that's going to give you the money that you need to support the lifestyle that you just said was important. So I'm asking you to dig mm -hmm. real deep into yourself. What do you want? What kind of work can you do that's gonna help you get what you want? So that's where we elaborate the most on as well? That's, yeah. Of what our goal this is this assignment one oh. all, all of the assignments are all about you this whole project is really all about you it's and it's being done to give you 
clarity on what career path do you need to take? Okay. So there's two parts of it, the note taking and what they were saying. But, and the last part is elab um, taking those points and making them and turning them and reflecting on them, but also making them into my own goals as well. How yeah. I deal with it? Yes, that's the most important piece. Okay, I finally got it. Oh my gosh. You got there. Congratulations. I'm so happy. That's good. Yes, Our because I was, yes, it took me so long. <laughs> It took me so long. Well, because, because I wasn't I wasn't understanding it because I go ahead. You were just oh, I thought my internet. I thought it was yeah, I didn't understand it when I was reading the instructions. I'm like, okay, well, I did the note taking, but I didn't read the last step where I had to um um, use those what they were saying and make also turn them into my own goals as well but with the idea with it that's the most important part i okay so <laughs> now i have an idea <laughs> okay i have an idea now <laughs> oh my god it's finally there no you know what this is called learning it's okay it took a while it's i'm okay. very slow <laughs> no i don't think you're slow i think you're really bright i think this i think what's happening is this is really different for you. You've not asked, you've not been asked to do this before. No, I never. It's usually them saying like, oh, just write note taking and just say what they were, just think, just write what they said and stuff like that. That's all we usually been doing, but never like those types of goals, but add them to my real long-term goals. I never been asked that. Yeah, no, that's what this is about. Yeah, this is, this is going to stretch you. This is good for you. I'm happy that you got there. Are you still with me? I don't, I, my screen isn't changing and I can't hear you. I think maybe we lost the connection. Okay. Are you there? We got the idea. I, awesome. I think, okay. got, oh no, it's my internet. It's my internet. I'm sorry. That's okay. But yes, right. I got the idea now. I got good. it. Got it. Got yes. It, it. Now I shall write it. There you go. All right, man. If yeah. anything, I can submit it again from, by, I think by next Friday, I can turn it in if that's okay. Can you get it done for me before then, like Tuesday? I Yeah, I can try. Yes. Okay, that'd be good. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a great night. You too. I'll see you later, okay? Okay, bye.